Well, welcome back to another episode of Continuum Meditations Discusses. In this episode, let's talk about the recently released six-part Disney Plus streaming series, Star Wars Obi-Wan Kenobi. To be honest with you folks, I did not expect to be back again with you so soon, so this will not be an in-depth analysis of the first two episodes of Obi-Wan Kenobi. It will only be a first impressions kind of thing, an off-the-cuff discussion of what I liked and what I did not like about the first two episodes. And I will warn you at this point that if you have not seen these first couple of episodes and you don't wish to be spoiled, feel free to veer off now and return at a later time. If you don't, however, care about that, then let's proceed onward. So let me begin by saying that once again, Maestro John Williams has knocked it out of the park. He created a theme for this particular series for Obi-Wan Kenobi, simply entitled Obi-Wan, something that he regretted not being able to do during the first trilogy series for many of the major characters. He did produce uh, theme songs for Princess Leia, for Luke Skywalker, later on for Anakin Skywalker. And the only character that he regretted not being able to ever get a theme song completed for was, in fact, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now, years later, decades later, he has managed to uh, refresh that screen, if you will, and get that accomplished, something I'm sure that he's very proud of. I must say I have thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, listening to it multiple times now. And so I would definitely commend that to you if you have not heard it yet or if you have not uh, put special attention on it in the actual TV show itself. Take a listen. I think this is something that you will certainly appreciate. So one of the things I think that was actually good about this series were, in fact, its opening moments. It took you through the journey of Anakin Skywalker all the way from a little child into his teenage and young adult years into his mature years until his final fall to the dark side with Emperor Palpatine, Darth Sidious, and so forth. It took you also, parallel to that, the journey of Obi-Wan Kenobi alongside of his former student, then friend, and then lost friend. And so I thought that those were some good montages that they opened up with to not only refresh the memory of Star Wars fans, of course, but to also clue in those people who may watch the series who are not Star Wars fans or who perhaps who may only be casual Star Wars fans. Thereafter, I really liked the scene that they had when they opened up at the Jedi Temple where you have this Jedi Master training her students in unarmed combat. I, in fact, on an, as an aside to that, have always thought that it was good, that it is good to see any of the Jedi's unarmed combat skills and training in action portrayed on screen, because most of the time, of course, we're seeing them uh, using their lightsabers, we're seeing them using the Force, but any reputable martial system will have unarmed combat skills as part of its repertoire. Unarmed combat skills will precede armed combat skills in any worthwhile martial arts system. Then, of course, we take this very tranquil scene and tranquil setting where the Jedi Master is teaching her students and showing them the way of you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat through this uh, form that she's taking them through. We take that from tranquil and very peaceful meditative movement, bam, immediately right to an attack on the Jedi Temple. Of course, this is Order 66 being executed by the clones. And so we see theoretical, I guess you, I guess you could say theoretical skills taken into real-world action right in the blink of an eye, with no warning whatsoever. I actually thought that that was a very nice touch. Well, then we move on, and it's ten years later. We see the titular figure of the program, Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi himself, living a very mundane and humdrum life as an ordinary worker on some type of food processing line, basically cutting up meat to be sold for consumption by whoever on the planet of Tatooine. It's a very, very interesting contrast to the life of adventure and purpose that he once lived as a Jedi Knight and Master. 
and what we see is a, uh, a sort of broken down and humbled, almost defeated Obi-Wan Kenobi, who has accepted the lot that fate has bestowed upon him in his attempt to try to hide and stay alive so that he can fulfill his purpose of watching over Luke Skywalker. I actually think that this is something of an appropriate stance. I do somewhat compare it to Luke Skywalker uh, in The Last Jedi, but I think it's a little bit different here because what you have seen between the contrast between Luke Skywalker, the older Luke Skywalker of the later Disney series, and the older Obi-Wan Kenobi of this particular uh, issue is that we know that this is what happens to Obi-Wan Kenobi in terms that he has to hide out on Tatooine. We don't know, however, that he is this kind of broken man, uh, defeated, depressed, and somewhat lost with respect to mission and purpose. But I think it is appropriate to see something of this portrayed in the character based upon the circumstances of how he got there. In fact, I think what you can say is that this very much is reflective of the hero's journey that we see in many stories, whether they be in print or in uh, some type of visual medium, where the hero does in fact have to go through, uh, if you want to call it uh, in these terms, a wilderness experience before he comes out of that wilderness experience, an experience of pain, or perhaps an experience of loss, an experience of lacking direction and, and, and purpose in life, before he comes out of that and rediscovers his mission and purpose and then begins to try to reconnect with his source of strength and power in order to continue to grasp and fulfill that mission and purpose. I know that there are probably those who would say, well, I wanted to see the kind of man that we saw 10 years ago, the man who was at the end of Revenge of the Sith, who was fully connected to the Force, who knew how to use his lightsaber, who knew his understanding of what it meant to be a Jedi Master, and who was ready to be gung-ho at every, at every instance, moving forward with strength and an undeniable um, conviction that's not always, that's not the way it works. And in great drama, and especially in classical literature and classical drama, it actually works in the opposite way. So I found nothing wrong with this at all. So we move on from there to meet a very young and very precocious and obviously rambunctious Princess Leia Organa in her childhood. Obviously supposed to mirror what she is to become more of as she gets older. And then she is kidnapped by the adversarial force of this storyline, which are basically uh, the Inquisitors who are hunting the Jedi, and one Inquisitor in particular, who we'll get to a little bit later. But as part of a ploy to b draw Obi-Wan Kenobi out into the open, young Princess Leia is kidnapped and basically made to endure this kidnapping so that uh, he, that is, Obi-Wan Kenobi, will come rescue her and, and of course uh, have a trap laid for him where he will be pulled away from pulled away from Tatooine, pulled away from Luke Skywalker whom no one knows about yet of course, but pulled away from these things so he can be drawn out into the open and captured and possibly uh, brought before, or obviously should I say brought before Darth Vader. So in this sense, first Obi-Wan Kenobi begins to reject this idea, he doesn't want to do it. We still can see, can still see um, aspects of him being, you know, something of a broken man and something of a man who is quite unsure of himself. He's disconnected from the Force. He's put away his lightsaber, buried it in the desert, but now he goes and gets it and we find that that's there and now he tries to resume his purpose in life, which is, of course, the Jedi Code to help others who are in need of that help. So that's the basic plot of the storyline without going into a great deal of detail and as I said it was not my purpose here to uh, thoroughly examine this story from beginning to end. I just wanted to give some of the highlights. But let's move on from there to what are I think some criticisms of this story and some of the holes that I do see in it. We'll start first of all with this these inquisitors that showed up early in the storyline. One of the scenes that I actually skipped over was the introduction of the Inquisitors very early in the storyline, right after the attack on the Jedi Temple, where they began an intimidation campaign 
against the locals in search of any rogue Jedi whom they believe are on the planet. And the Grand Inquisitor begins the hunt, and naturally, as he should, leading the effort to try to smoke out this rogue Jedi, but is interrupted by an Inquisitor whom we come to know as Reva. Now, one of my criticisms, not of this particular scene, although I did not really care for the fact that she so early and abruptly interrupted the Grand Inquisitor's efforts, which I did find to be rather subtle and intimidating on their own, and I had wished that they had gone further. But, leaving that aside, we, see, we are introduced to the character of Reva, whom I believe does in fact show up at the beginning of the show as one of the younglings who is training in the Jedi Temple. Uh, I think that is a foreshadowing going on there. What she does is to continually defy the Grand Inquisitor, and this is shown at least three times to my recollection in the storyline, where she disobeys direct orders from the Grand Inquisitor to keep her place within the hierarchy of Inquisitors and to obey his orders without question, but she doesn't do that. And several times I'm wondering to myself, why is this being tolerated by the Grand Inquisitor? Especially if this is the same Grand Inquisitor, which it is, whom we see in Star Wars Rebels, who smacked down many people. This is not the kind of Grand Inquisitor that I expected to see in this storyline, and it didn't seem to be the kind of person who was advertised in the trailers that we saw. So this Reva begins to get on my nerves, at least, because of her insolence, and because that insolence goes unpunished so many times, ultimately to the degree that in the, one of the final scenes of the second episode, she runs this the Grand Inquisitor through with her lightsaber and effectively leaves him for dead, while mocking him at the same time. I am going my, to myself, why wasn't this woman force choked out of existence by the second time she did this? I did not understand this at all. So that's one of my criticisms here of this storyline. But what we do see, however, is that this Reva, who is also known as the third sister, has some type of ongoing obsession with Obi-Wan Kenobi. An obsession that has not yet been explained within the storyline, and I'm hoping that it soon will be because otherwise, to me, her character, the anger that her, her character continues to display, the defiance that her character continues to display is not making any sense. Obviously, we are meant to kind of fall in love with little Princess Leia and how cute she is and how smart she is and how defiant she seems to be, as I said before, um, inklings of what she is going to become later on in life. But the question remains, what is her purpose here in this storyline in the first instance. Why is she here? When our focus, at least we are presumed, we presume that our focus is supposed to be first on the titular character of the program, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and secondly on his charge, Luke Skywalker, the young Luke Skywalker, who is now on Tatooine awaiting the fulfillment of his destiny. So I question what are we doing with Princess Leia, a young Princess Leia? Is this the only way the writers thought that they could have called this old Jedi Master effectively out of the enforced retirement that he's put himself in and back into action? I think not. There are, I, there are a myriad of ways that they could have approached this that have nothing to do with Princess Leia and nothing to do, by the way, with the canon violation that introducing him to her ten years on or early before the events of A New Hope introducing him to her in those canon breaking events what that what that all of that precipitates because now we have to examine why the older princess leia of a new hope fame does not seem to remember the general kenobi that she references in that speech that holographic speech of hers yet she is supposed to have gone through these harrowing life-changing events with him as a little girl of 10 years old this makes no sense whatsoever, and, and I don't understand why we have to be subjected to this uh, nonsense in writing. Now, there are other criticisms that I could levy, but for the sake of time and brevity, I choose not to go into all of them in detail. Despite the fact, though, that you've seen me bring these criticisms against the show, I still think that there is a good deal in here that is entertaining and enjoyable to watch. 
and I most certainly without question am enjoying the performance of Ewan McGregor as he returns to the role of Obi-Wan Kenobi and what he is now bringing to it in his more mature years and with his more mature perspective on the character. So those things are very much to be appreciated and have been very much appreciated by me. And I will look forward to seeing this performance unfold as I will look forward to seeing the other characters unfold and how they are fitting into the broader perspective of this particular storyline. And while I'm on that subject, let me say this. I believe that we need people who really do understand and respect the source material. And I'm not entirely sure that in this case we have that in its entirety. I, for example, thought that this story was written by Dave Filoni and or John Favreau, and as I came to find out, that is not the case. I don't know exactly what their involvement was, if any, but I know that by comparison to The Mandalorian, which I extremely very much enjoyed its first two seasons, the edge on this show that I was frankly expecting was not there. It is missing. And I believe that that kind of edge is something that both Dave Filoni and John Favreau bring to their writing of Star Wars and to their creativity within Star Wars because they understand and respect and also love the source material and I'm hoping that we are not getting people here who do not appreciate that who do not appreciate how to write correct and proper dialogue for Star, Star Wars who do not appreciate how to craft the characters for Star Wars that we have come to know and love and yet they're winging it because they don't have this 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 principled understanding this principled foundation of how this is supposed to work with that being said star wars fans i will leave you until next time should i choose to do more reviews on obi-wan kenobi you will see those posted if not we'll let these things be as they stand therefore until next time star wars fans may the force be with you always